Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Second Breakfast Podcast. I'm Andy Roth, alongside Phil Duvall. Say hi, Phil. Hi. Hey, and Andy, Andy, Andy. What's that, Phil? There's someone else here. What do you do? Oh, my That's, God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, yes, uh, we welcome back yet another guest. Uh, the first one who I didn't know before we fired up the yeah. old Skype machine. Yeah. Uh, so, frankly, viewers and listeners, I'm terrified. It's uh, all on me. If this if this guy fails, it's my bad. Completely. So, there's a part of me that kind of wants him to fail, just so I can blame Phil for something else. Uh, Everybody say hi to my friend Chris Robinson. Hey, Chris. Hey, guys. Uh, <laughs> Does it make me a terrible person that I sort of want to fail now? If it's all, if all the blanks go into Phil, Chris, no. <laughs> no, you're supposed to be on friend. my team, Chris. Chris, I'm come just on. Saying, if, if my options are all the blame goes towards Phil, or I do a good show, it's a fifty-fifty, really win-win. Amen. <laughs> Amen, brother. Right there. Andy, is it too late for me to pick a different guest host? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you pulled Daniel over to your side within like 30 seconds it's last true. time. It's so true. It's true. I make right. no apologies. Here's the deal. Today we want to talk about uh, today we want to talk about something really it's a big trend that's been go that's going on right now, but it's really a very recent trend and that's that 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 it's as big as it is and that's comic book movies. And so we brought on our my friend Chris. Chris is one of my best friends from seminary, uh, one of my buddies and Chris is I consider him one of my comic book gurus. Um, I'll go to him to ask him about like different comic books and if they're worth my time, which I still never end up reading them, but at least I know that I, if I did, they'd be good. Um, and throughout school, he'd always try to hand me stuff and try to get me to read it. And Chris, I think one of the main reasons we wanted to have you on is not only um, are you super opinionated like us, and not only do you love comic books, but you also specifically love movies like we do, and so you have a particular interest in comic book, how comic books translate to movies. Andy and I see comic book movies all the time. Like, we've seen all the comic book movies that one can see, pretty much, but we don't actually know the source material. And and you're someone who, like, I remember we were talking one time in seminary, and you were like, oh, yeah, that's a really good movie, but it doesn't, it's not really, it doesn't really fit a comic book, or that one's really good, and it actually is like a comic book. And I was like, I believe you. <laughs> so I guess the first question, so that, those are your bona fides, so to speak. I mean, we trust you as a comic book guru. Um, but what, what, what would be some, like, give us, give the listeners an example of some of your favorite comic books. Not comic book movies, just comic books. Just comic books. Um, there's some really classic ones. The Dark Knight uh, Returns by uh, Frank Miller. Um, um, v for Vendetta. Uh, there's a great series called Transmetropolitan. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that a guy who I like now is writing now named uh, Mark, and I want to say his last name place Millar, is pronounced Millar, uh, does, and he does a wide variety of things. Um, I'm pretty sure he wrote Wanted, which was adapted into a movie, but okay. the comic book series is absolutely and completely different from the movie and hmm. a thousand times better than what was it? <laughs> And not, and not terrible. Oh, you thought the movie was decent? That's fair. I mean, I thought it was decent as what it was, but okay. the the comic book is actually really great because it turns a lot of the traditional sort of tropes and things on its head. That's uh, those are a few of the ones I really like. He did uh, he did uh, Kick Ass as well, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, and he he I, does a lot of that rather than doing. Um, he's done some series work. I think that's just sort of how you get your street credit in sure. the comic book industry. But he also does. A lot of shorter mini series type things like Kick Ass, uh, Wanted. He's done um, one with Jesus, or not Jesus, but one with uh, the Son of the Devil as the main character who is supposed to bring around, bring around Armageddon, but he refuses to. You got the Son of the Devil and Jesus mixed up? No, so Jesus is actually the Son of the Devil's good friend. Somebody didn't pay attention in seminary. <laughs> they they didn't have any issues. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, so I noticed already, just getting into this, um, you, you mentioned a bunch of things that you're favorite, and you really didn't mention any superhero comics. I mean, Dark Knight, Batman is technically a superhero, but he doesn't have superpowers. I noticed that, I mean, are you not are you not generally drawn to superhero comic books, or? I am. Uh, I th think the, the difficulty there for me is that um, I'm not as drawn to specific runs, um, that's a big thing in superhero comic books because a series like Green Lantern, Amazing Superman, Spectacular Spider-Man have been going on for decades at this point. 
Right. And so what usually people are huge fans of is particular runs. And I, in general, right. sort of, I like a lot of the story arcs. Um, and so it's more difficult when you get into talking about runs because then you're talking about what a specific artist or author has done with that character. So, for instance, when they recently, when they were like, Spider-Man died, he only died in one of the runs, but there's four other different Spider-Mans going on. Yeah, that- and sometimes they'll do a, they'll do a cross, cross uh, it's not series, but cross story, uh, cross title. That's, what, that's the term. Like the X-Men and title. the Avengers get together and stuff like that. Yeah, or even like uh, when Superman died, um, the death of Superman, that leading up to his actual death, he went through all of the different Superman comics, and then while he was dead, um, they rebooted all of the all of his wow. lines, all four comic lines, with different Superman uh, stand-ins. And so oh, they had right. or they had Steel, they had Superboy, and they had one more whose name I can't remember, uh, who was some sort of Kryptonian self-defense mechanism in the Fortress of Solitude. It, that was one of the sillier. I love that. that. By the way. We just did a podcast where someone said Kryptonian self-defense mechanism in the Fortress of Solitude. I don't even know. We're done. That's... We're done. Yeah. It's yeah, all downhill. I think, uh, all right, Internet. <laughs> everything has now happened. I mean, right. <laughs> Go outside and sit under a tree with a book. Seriously. Like Ferdinand the Reluctant Bull, because I think we are now done with <laughs> <laughs> pretending we have any relevance with your life. Um, comic book movies... I mean, even, dude, even when we were in school not that long ago, they were just like, when, when you and I were, I mean, it was our senior year when Iron Man came out. And that really was, before that, I mean, there really wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near as big a deal. There was Spy- Spider-Man was a big deal. Well, yeah, I'd actually back you up there. I'd say where it started was X-Men. Okay. Um, that prior to that, you had Punisher. There were two Punisher, or there was one Punisher movie before that with Dolph Lundgren that was awful. Um, it never got released in the states. I mean, people have seen it, but it never got an actual release. I didn't right. even know that. I have seen it. And you are it is... you are one of the lucky few. <laughs> <laughs> if you like Dolph Lundgren, it is great. Um, so and who doesn't like Dolph Lundgren? If you if you like Dolph Lundgren, that's a small group of people. <laughs> it's, it's not a mainstream audience they're looking for. There. I don't even think Mrs. Dolph Lundgren has seen all of his movies. Keep the gloves up. Keep them up. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Um, but uh, uh, X Men, they took you know just a ton of stars already and put them in a movie together and put it out there, and people went crazy for it. And after that came the three Spider Man movies, the rest of the X Men movies, uh, and Marvel actually at that point uh, launched. They had a whole run of Fantastic Four movies, which weren't Fantastic good, Four, but, uh, but terrible. Three but they were Blade fun. movies. And so uh, Marvel. And that, sorry, go ahead. Well. But we know that before all that, Superman and Batman were both always part of the picture. Right. Right. And I on mean, TV, Wonder Woman was a big deal. But other than that, you had Superman and Batman. Hulk. Yeah, and Incredible Hulk on TV as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, and I don't know, I mean, any. I wonder why Superman and Batman have always been part of the picture for people. Well, I think Superman and Batman are probably the two most recognizable superheroes of all time. And I think you run into a chicken and egg question as to... Were they recognizable because they got TV shows and movies, or did they get TV shows and movies because they were recognizable? Uh, Superman, the first superhero, really, uh, is was, was probably famous before he got his movies. He was famous that whole generation. The people who were old enough, well, the people who were old uh, enough to go to movies when those first movies came out, their parents had been fans of Superman and probably read Superman comics when they were kids. Um, so, I mean, Superman had been around a long time by the time his movies sort of came out. Um, I mean, Action Comics, Action Comics number one was what, 1938, something like that? I mean, sure. I mean, and Detective Comics, which is Batman, isn't isn't far behind. Right. What, is, and that like, what DC, is that what DC stands for? No. Oh, OK. I don't, I, I don't think so. But Action Comics is Superman and Detective Comics is Batman. And that's pretty much the comic book geekiest thing that i know but uh that's pretty comic book geeky though well thanks phil i appreciate it um let's uh let's let's segue into let's segue into movies because here's what i'm interested in uh well i'm interested in many things but here's what i'm interested in talking about right now 
so you had, I mean, you had the the campy 60s Batman TV series, right? But in terms of we're going to we're going to treat this with at least a modicum of a res- of the respect that the people who read the comic books treat the character, right? With uh I think the first one would probably be the first Superman movie, right? Which was 77, 79, somewhere around there. Um yeah, late 70s. Why do you think do you think it's just like a special effects thing like they're that there you can write you can draw things you can't you couldn't necessarily show in movies why do you think there was such a like a because the superman movies were huge hits like it wasn't like they didn't make money if they could have done why didn't right, they get so a superman Spider-Man superman movie? made a superman made a buttload of money and yeah. then the studios weren't like all right right let's make aquaman let's it's happening Sp- now Spider- because right. they're all making money, but why didn't why did I mean it's not like studios just started liking making money? Well, I think part of it is I mean at that age of movies you're talking about a lot less licensing in general, a lot more original storytelling in cinema, and the properties that they licensed out to make movies out of were only the ones that the, not just that they thought they might make money of, it was the ones that they knew they'd make money and thought they might make crazy money. Right. Um, So they were, I mean, they were really looking at Batman, Superman, and then, you know, then early on, though, Superman 3 stumbled really bad. That's true. And And with good reason. ...of the rest of the movies, and then, you know, Batman, the first Batman movie was great. Um, I love the second one. The second one was very good, too, Batman Returns. But then the same thing, the third movie began, it took a pretty big stumble, Joel Schumacher took over, and then the fourth movie... Um, is was, it's it's terrible. It is. It's my it's, least favorite movie of all time. Actually, it is incoherent. It and not in like a fun. I was doing grass in the '60s kind of way. It's just incoherent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but but you see little from, you see little moments of people trying to make comic book movies work. Uh, you mentioned the Punisher. Judge Dredd when we were kids uh, came out. It did though. It wasn't good, but they did. They tried. It's true. And, it's true. You're and right. another one, which was one of the worst films I've ever seen. I don't even want to use the word film. One of the worst <laughs> things that ever happened to my eyeballs was Spawn. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw it. I never. I actually. I never actually saw it. K. Terribile, my friends in the <laughs> South would say. Well, I think what you see there, though, with the movies you just listed, with Spawn, with um, oh, what was the one you said right before, the Judge Dredd, Judge and Dredd, with the Punisher, Punisher, is. The people, the characters they're picking there are not mainstream, right. super popular characters. Except Spawn was to a certain extent, but he wasn't main. He was popular, but not mainstream in the sense that Agreed. your mom wasn't going to know who Spawn Spawn is. Right. Your mom knows who Captain America is. But it's funny that they were taking chances on the smaller ones. Another big one from my high school years, which I think was very successful, actually, was the first Crow. Yeah, and that was well, Dark Horse Comics, I believe. I think they yeah. they they those. That was Dark Horse. Spawn was Image. Image. Um, I think part of the reason why they took a huge chance or took a chance on those is because they were crazy violent. Um, and so that was a niche that they could fill. And they thought, okay, we'll make a comic book movie. Comic books are violent. We'll pick a really violent comic book and we'll get that market to come see our movie. And it, and, and uh, I want to buy the rights to The Crow is not as expensive as I want to buy the rights to Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for their bigger, uh, you know, their bigger characters, I think you probably had some resistance, I would imagine, from comic book studios to release the rights to their characters. You know, they didn't want somebody to make a Captain America movie and make it as bad as the Punisher, that Dolph Lundgren Punisher movie was, and then have people stop buying Captain America comics. Right. right. Uh, because the character had been poisoned. Speaking uh, of which... Have we all seen the 1980s Captain America movie? Have we seen that? Yeah. It is... Yeah. Viewers, listeners. We saw it so you wouldn't have to. It is so... It, it There are clips on YouTube. Find it and cancel the rest of your appointments for the day. It is so much fun because it is Rose, so absurd. Rose, hold all my calls. Ah. Um, interesting. So, so... So let's talk, let's, let's get more, let's get more into sort of like the structure of a, of a superhero movie, because, 
because comic book movie or superhero movie? Sorry, you yes, sorry, my bad. Comic book movie. Um, tell me what you think about this statement. We are seeing an era of comic book movies where they are treating the movies actually like they like you would treat the release of a run of comic books. In other words, in other words, you're always we're always starting with an origin story, right? Which makes okay. sense and that's not necessarily a thing, but like you've now you've got now you've got the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You've got You've got DC trying to put together a Justice League uh, movie before, like they're doing it the other way. Like we're gonna do one movie with everyone, and then we're gonna have things split off. Which I'm that. excited about. I hope that works, but I, I don't think it will. But I'd like the idea. The latest news is not encouraging. I don't know if you've seen it. No, I haven't. What's the latest news? Uh, it that that it the, they got a script turned in, and it was like so bad that like they're like we cannot salvage this. We need to start we're over. Oh God! And it's not that surprising, <laughs> right? And it's got a 2015 release date or 2014. Wait, Andy. Okay, okay, Chris. Why is that not surprising? Well, hold on. Let's come back to the Justice League movie because I think okay. that's okay. That's we'll come back to that. Go, uh, you want to answer Andy's about, question? We can talk about that and the Avengers and compare them in a minute. But to answer Andy's question mm -hmm. about um, sort of the structure, I think actually what you have the Marvel Universe doing is totally different than what you were saying and what we're familiar with with comic book movies. Okay. Um, up until now, as a studio owns a limited number of films or owns the rights for a limited amount of time, you know, uh, right. I think it's Fox owns Spider-Man and only, but they get to make like eight Spider-Man movies. It's something like that. Right. Uh, and then Marvel has the option to take the rights back, which they almost certainly will. And so they gave a director a package for a certain amount of time and let him create his own world. What that means at the end of it, though, is to continue. When you get a new director, they want to do the same thing, and so you've got to reboot the franchise, what we mm -hmm. just saw with The Amazing Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. um, the difference with what Marvel is doing, I think, is that they're creating an entire universe with lots of different characters, which is going to prevent them from, I think in a lot of ways, prevent them from doing single-character reboots. Um, there's a term in comic books and in lots of other uh, genre is called retconning and it's when um for a long time green lantern retconning retcon r-e-t-c-o-n and what does that stand for retroactive uh, continuity there you go okay um so like green lantern for a long time was vulnerable to the color yellow and to wood that's just the golden age you know early comic book that was those, those were his vulnerabilities and so it was Wow, Most, I learned something today. I didn't know that. I didn't know he was. I, I didn't know he was like vulnerable to wood. I did. I knew the yellow thing, which I think is, to be perfectly honest, kind of silly enough. But go, sorry, go ahead. Do you want to come hang out in my log cabin, Green Lantern? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it mostly involved his villains wearing various yellow outfits, so he couldn't do things to them. It was a pretty ridiculous concept. Hmm. Um, but. Je Jeff Johns, who's a uh, writer, um, when he took over the Green Lantern retconned those problems out because he saw them and said, that's silly. And so he went through and explained why the old Green Lanterns had this problem. And he created this whole storyline about why there was this yellow weakness with the rings. That's the same thing that they do, that I think Marvel is going to have to do with their movies from now on. They're not going to be able to just say, all right, Iron Man, uh, you know, Robert Downey Jr. can't be Iron Man and Iron Man 17 we're going to have to get a younger guy. We can't reboot because Iron Man was just in this movie with Captain America and we want him to be in the same another movie with Captain America two summers from now. And so we can't totally scrap the character and rebuild. So what we've got to do is just either subtly change the actor or do some retcon work to explain how this new Iron Man came into existence or to pay, pass the torch, something like that. Huh. Do do you not think though that that they might just pull a James Bond on it? They might. I, I, I mean, think that the best move. Um, I also think it's a, it's probably the best chance they have for a character to die. Um, one of the things I think would be really great was if somebody, if DC is smart enough to just keep Chris Nolan's vision of the Batman universe and let Joseph Gordon Levitt become Batman, and yeah. Bruce Wayne is no longer Batman. Yeah. I think that could be yeah. An amazing story to talk to, sort of portray exactly what 
the Dark Knight trilogy was about, that Batman is bigger than Bruce Wayne. And the comic books just won't ever let that happen. You know, Bruce Wayne did die and got thrown back into prehistoric time and then had a journey through time to get back. And when he came back, and while he was gone, they had this huge battle did for the Ga- Did he become Gandalf the White when he got back? or Because <laughs> that's what it sounded like you were just talking about. Bruce he became, Wayne. Yes, that's what they called uh, me. He became but what? Chris? A cow thing where all, the, all of his like various sidekicks fought over who would be Batman. Dick Grayson won, became Batman, and then Batman showed back up, and it was like, oh, well, Bruce Wayne wants to be Batman again. Hmm. Right, Dick when, was like, and Dick was like, I guess I'll be Robin. What, did, is that when he became uh, Nightwing or whatever it is? Do, 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 do. This is recent. I, I actually don't know what they did oh, after okay. that. When he um, got back from prehistoric times, I was like, all right, this is ridiculous. Right. See, that's the thing for me, right? Like, you hit on something. There's all these different plot lines, and they do all this different stuff. I love comic book movies. I do not. I try to care about the comic books that inspire them, and it just doesn't last very long. Uh, last a couple years ago, I was teaching a class on mythology, and I got into like I was like, um, and all these comic book movies were coming out, and the Thor movie was about to come out, and I was like, I'm gonna look into Thor, and I'm gonna look into, and I went to this comic book store, and they had a Hercules comic book that was just coming out, and I started talking to the comic book store guy, and he's like, man, he was like the total. He was the total prototypical comic book store guy, but he was like, there's two different kinds of comic book store guys. There's like, you suck because you don't know as much as me comic book guy. And then there's the, let me bring you into this world comic book guy. And this guy was so excited that I wanted to know about comic books. He was this close, like as close to my face as you could be and just pure excitement and joy. And he was like, you got it, man, you got to read this. Do you have a wife? Ooh, you know, you need to buy this for her. She'll love this comic book. And I was like, my wife's not going to like comic books. Oh, she will when she reads this. She'll read and she'll love this. And so he like, I walked out of there with like a stack of things. I read through all of them. And then when I was done, I was like, I don't want to go back to the comic book store. And it, it was like, <laughs> Not because I didn't like them. I just, I don't know. So I guess my thing is, like you mentioned, like there's all these these crazy things and it's like, I, I wonder what the, oh, and here's the other thing. I asked that guy. I said to him, all these comic book movies, it's so popular right now. Is it, bo- is it boosting your business? And he goes, not really. Yeah. Like, it seems like this is supposed to be this amazing thing and you'd think it would really like pump up people like maybe I'm going to start reading comic books and there are a couple people like me who try but it seems like people love comic book movies but have no interest in reading comic books yeah uh, but I mean you know people love all sorts of movies and have no interest in reading books people <laughs> love Godfather how many of them read Mario Puzo's book I, I read the book but I was in college I too. And, yeah, I, but it's great it's worth reading anybody watching but People, a lot of times the source material doesn't get that sort of respect. I think, it, I mean, the, the thing I like about current and contemporary comic book movies is that they're telling comic book stories. And I don't mean that just in the sense that they're literally, like, telling the same stories that are in comic books, but, like, Chris Nolan's Batman uh, trilogy yes. is told the way a comic book is laid out. You have an origin story. You have the introduction of the great villain. um, and then at the end, you have the fall. And Chris Nolan chose to leave his character fallen, basically. Um, in the sense that Batman dies at the end. Normally in a comic book, he fake die and then come back and, ba- and Gotham City would rejoice that he was back. Right. Um, Interesting. But here, Batman leaves, and that's when Chris Nolan also makes his exit. But that's a comic book story, the way that's, he's telling So this is weird because, to me, I have, I have argued throughout the time that I've watched the Dark Knight movies, that the Dark Knight movies are not a comic, are not comic book movies. Because they don't, to, and, and I could just be wrong about that, and you, may, you might be saying that I'm wrong about that, but like, I've always argued that to me, one, they don't feel like comic book movies compared to like every other comic book movie there is. And two, the entire conceit of the, of, of, in my mind, of Christopher Nolan's trilogy is... That's it's 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 saying to the world like we don't need superheroes, that superheroes bring more harm than good. Yeah. yeah. So I had always thought of his movies as the anti comic book movie, but you're saying that in fact it's like a pretty, just proto or pretty typical or pretty pretty uh, exemplary comic book movie. Yeah, I mean I think his his. Uh, um... 
motivation, inspiration is so clearly taken from some of the great Batman stories. Um, you know, Jack Nicholson's Joker was campy and sort of ridiculous and was a really, it was almost sort of a jarring juxtaposition between him and Michael Keaton's Batman, who was grim yeah. and serious. It was a sort of weird tension in the film, and, and it works, but it's unusual. Whereas uh, Heath Ledger's Joker and uh, Christian Bale's Batman are very much like some of the more modern Joker Batman stories in which the Joker is chaos and Batman is order. Good and evil are irrelevant. Interesting. Uh, yeah, they're is in the, the same movie. They're in the as much as I as much as I love Keaton and Nicholson in Burton's Batman, I do love them both and I love the movie as a whole. They're not necessarily in the same movie. And yeah. Bale and Ledger are absolutely in the same movie. That's interesting. Yeah. And so I think like in that movie I don't think there is any sort of like superheroes aren't bad because Gotham needs Batman because the Joker's a lunatic and the only person that can stop the Joker who isn't dedicated to evil. He's just dedicated to chaos um, is somebody dedicated to order above and beyond being dedicated to good. Um, that's one of the things I like so much about Batman in general is that. Is but that what frustrates me about superhero movies a lot of the time and I love them I love watching them, but what bothers – and I like the mythology a lot, the origin story a lot. But what bothers me a lot is so often the bad guy wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the good guy. And so it's like – I mean, so, so the whole reason – like if if like Iron Man drives me nuts because it's like – and I love Iron Man. But it's just like, oh, I've got to stop this one guy who wouldn't exist if I didn't exist. And that's kind of true in Iron Man 2 as well. Yeah. That's well, see, literally how tell- Batman begins to ends, right? Like, like Gary Oldman, you know, uh, Lieutenant Gordon comes in and is like, you've started something, things are escalating. And he flips right. over the playing card, right? Right. Yeah. I'd say that's true for Iron Man 2. I'd argue with you on Iron Man 1, though, like, yes. Um, uh, Je- Jedediah, Jebediah Stane? Je- Jebediah, yeah. Jebediah Stane becomes uh, Iron Monger, which is that character's actual name in the comic book, although I don't know if it's really mentioned in the... I don't the think it is. Video. It's not. No. Um, but he puts on the huge war suit, and he's able to do it because of what Tony Stark has already done. But it's not like he wasn't a bad guy anyway. He was dealing weapons to terrorists. Right. Uh, Iron Man is able to combat his evil and is able to call him out and sort of fight him. Even if he hadn't built a giant suit, he still had all of Stark weapons. And yeah. so he could have, you know, he, I mean, yeah, he builds a big suit because Iron Man has a big suit and Iron but Man the, the suit the, gives yeah. him the too, but he but already like, had the, big... like, like, what's it called? Uh, uh, St. Hulk, uh, in the, in the, uh, either, either edition, but, but we'll talk about the, we'll talk about the second, the more popular one with, with, uh, Ed Norton, uh, that the red bad guy only he's it. The whole thing is like, he's created because the Hulk was created. He's created as a response to the Hulk. And that, right. I mean, if you're just walking downtown in New York City and these two things start fighting, it's like, well, wait a minute, that red one's only there because of the green one. That's not really fair. Right. You think I'm still dead. Right. Either way, <laughs> this sucks. I wish they would have stopped doing it. We, what's really interesting about Superman 1 is Lex Luthor, Luthor, Lex Luthor is Lex Luthor, and he's going to do what he's going to do. And Superman literally is like fighting a legitimate bad guy that was going to be a bad guy no matter what. Yeah. I think or, that's the thing is. I think a lot of these guys, though, the idea is that they're going to be bad guys no matter what. But because the superheroes on the scene, they have to up their game to be bad guys. Um, you know, that's true about all of Spider-Man's villains. Uh, you know, um, well, not in the movies, but in the comic books, you know, Dr. Octopus puts on the octopus suit over and over again so that he can fight Spider-Man. Interesting. You know, he's a and smart even, guy. He could rob a bank, but I he puts mean, on the even, octopus suit so that he can rob a bank and fight Spider-Man. Right. Right. Even uh, even Batman in general and Nolan's Batman films, while I don't think it dilutes the message at all, and I agree with you, Phil, I think you're right, it's not like, A, the League of Shadows existed before Batman, and B, it's not like Gotham was, like, basically crime-free. Before. Well, and the League of Shadows was going to take over, take down Gotham anyway, so right. that's fair. That's a fair point. But I do, I mean, I am, I'm not way off on this, right? Like, a lot yeah. of times these things no, happen... And it's like, why? Well, what if the bet? I don't know. I guess I'm more interested in like, 
I mean, even Avengers, which is uh, to me the ultimate of the superhero movies that we've seen so far. Um, it, it, even that one, it's like they wouldn't be coming and taking, and they actually address it in the movie. The only reason they even know about Earth and to, to conquer it is because Thor showed up on Earth at some point. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, but, and, and the thing that I always think is, is even more jarring, though, is like, okay, so Batman is patrolling Gotham. Why are supervillains going to Gotham? Go to, go to, go to Tulsa and mess yeah. things up. No one, first of, all, first of all, no go one's going to... Go to Seattle. No one's going to defend Tulsa, first of all. They'll just be like, take it. <laughs> oh. Well, the only thing about Tulsa is everybody That's has guns. So. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, quick Tulsa, question. Quick. I'm sorry. Let's get back on the let's get back on the game here. Uh, uh, C Rob, uh, what is? Give give a, give me one or two of your like. Do you have a favorite comic book movie? I would say my favorite superhero movie hmm. is probably Iron Man two, and that right. has to do wow. way more with the actual plot. I so love this. actual plot, and way more with the fact that. Robert Downey Jr. literally is Tony Stark. Yeah. It's it's the, if not the best, Christopher Reeves as Superman is really the only casting and competition in a, in a comic book movie where they found, well, except for Sam Jackson as, uh, Nick, as uh, Nick Fury, but they had already written that character as Sam Jackson. Right, before the movies right, were um, right. But... That is one of the best moments of casting, where and I, it's something people worry about. I mean, I think we forget that. Like before the movie came out, people were like, "Can he carry this franchise?" And the answer is yes. <laughs> that's true. That's that's really interesting. I want to say just just, and then I want to hear more more comic book movies that you like. But I'm so glad that Iron Man Two is your favorite. By the way, that's just fascinating. Uh, go ahead. I I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, lo I love Iron Man Two. Andy doesn't like it as much as I do, but Andy, go ahead. I like it very much. I don't. I flat out don't love it and i think it's i i think it's because of the villain and the final yeah. fight is kind of terrible but uh but one thing i'll say you know and 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 chris you made, you made a really interesting point uh about you know one thing that they do in comics a lot a lot because they can always retcon is they kill off their characters i guarantee i am i am i'm mark it down ladies and gentlemen i guarantee if Joss Whedon not only directs Avengers 2, but Avengers 3, one of the Avengers will die in one of those movies. Wow. I guarantee it. He kills favorite he kills favorite characters all the time. All I know time. I know a potential spoiler about Avengers 2, and I don't know if that's something we want to discuss here. No. Okay. Nope. No, no spoilers. Okay, we will talk about that off the air because I think there is an alternative option to that. Okay, um, and I won't say what it is. So, okay. but but it is. I read. I was like, I don't normally care about spoil. I don't normally want to know spoilers, but for some reason, I read this. Anyway, oh, we'll talk I about know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. Uh, I think I know what you're talking about. Let's okay. keep talking well, about it to tease. We'll all talk of later. All right. Um, so, um, uh, so Iron Man two. What else? Yeah, I think that's probably my favorite superhero comic book movie. No, Probably my non, favorite non superhero. Non -superhero <laughs> I think it would be a, it would be a close tie between three hundred and V for Vendetta, uh, yeah. and I think those two are interesting because they did two totally different things that are. It's an important decision when you're making a comic book movie to figure out which you're going to do. Three hundred is very true to the source material, almost a literal shot for shot like remake they used, of the comic book. Like they used the comic book as storyboards for the right. film. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the iconic scene when they when the Spartans push the tro uh, the uh, Persians off the cliff is right. literally a, a two page spread in the comic. Right. Um and then Viva Vendetta, they did almost the exact opposite. They decided we've got to update this. And so they went from a Margaret Thatcher, which is when it was written was in fear of Margaret Thatcher from mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher style UK to admittedly uh, they said they were doing this a George Bush um, right. sort of fear that they wanted to move more towards this neoconservative uh, religious right um, what they viewed the government of America as at that time because they were making a movie for Americans at the end of the day right. and um, the author of the comic book had been writing for British people I, uh, and everybody else but he was writing what he knew right I I I want to add I want to add one. To, to this part of the discussion, then I really want to talk about this uh, uh, for a bit because 
because faithfulness to the to the source material is something I find fascinating as a as a fan of Lord of the Rings, both the novels and the books, and a fan of many things that are adaptations. In in, in I mean, Doctor Zhivago is an adaptation, right? So, um, I mean, you what know, a weird so, choice. Well, I yeah, true, yeah, but I'm a weird guy. What are you gonna well, do? Welcome, welcome, welcome to my world, Chris. <laughs> welcome to my world. Um, so. So the, the movie I'm going to add is Watchmen, and and are you going to pretend that it's not a comic, a, a superhero movie? No. Okay, go ahead, continue. How about how about you how about you cool your jets there, tough guy? Huh? Yeah. Um. So I, I am going to talk about spoilers for this. Uh, basically, the plot of the movie is a superhero basically invents a invents an evil. Uh, in order to get all of the countries of the world to unite and cause world peace. Um, but to do so, he has to become evil himself and blah, blah, blah. And the thing that the movie did was it changed what that ultimate evil was. And the more I think about it, and I've actually read things on it, it totally destroyed the metaphor of the book. Like, utterly. And, and, so, and so that was something that just seemed changed for no reason um and i guess i want to talk about that like i I guess i well first off what are your thoughts about watchmen the graphic novel and watchmen the movie uh watchmen the graphic novel i mean it it's probably critically the most acclaimed graphic novel of all time you know i think like time put it on on its 100 most influential novels of the 20th century list like i mean it's a huge deal Right. literature wise because it, it's probably the peak of, of comics as literature right um and i would actually say phil it's not really a superhero movie because it's because dedicated no one has superpowers to, well and it's dedicated to deconstructing the tropes of superheroes like that was its purpose when it was written was to sort sure. of unstack and take that apart um and so i think uh it's a it's a great it's a great book. It's one of those comics that I've read, and I've read a couple of times, but it's not one that I'm like, oh, I have to go read Watchmen again, like just randomly, because it's not really like a fun comic book to read. Like, it's good. <laughs> but it's hard. It. Yeah, it's sort of like you watch Schindler's List every few years because you're like, I should rewatch Schindler's List. That's a really great movie. But you don't like sit down on your couch one Saturday. I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never said that sentence. I've never said, <laughs> I should rewatch Schindler's List. Oh, I, I saw Schindler's List once. I'm all set. I will watch it again because my wife and I are doing the AFI Top 100, so we will watch it again. But it's not like, woo! <laughs> yeah, and I'm to be fair, you. Schindler's List and Watchmen are not exactly equal, probably, in no, the emotional but, impact they have. But, but, well, but there, I read the book. I, you know, the funny thing is, I, Chris and I, Andy, Chris and I saw Watchmen together opening night, and I had to borrow the book from him. I borrowed the book from him the day before, and I read Watchmen in a 24 hour period sure. and then we went and saw the movie sure and um the book totally messed me up yeah the, like yeah, the just book totally intense. messed me up yep the movie did not mess me up i'll Fair. just leave it at that it did not mess me up Fair. well i think the andy what you said about where they 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 went away from the source material in some places but the places where they picked to stay with it uh, the necessity of Dr. Manhattan wandering around nude for a huge portion of the movie. I, I, wasn't, I didn't see the necessity of that. If you're going to move away from the source material, give that man a loincloth. Right. Have you're, just, you're just poking the bear at that point. You're just yeah. like, look what I can do because it's in the yeah. comic. And that's not... Right. Yeah. yeah. Have him wear a fancy suit. Right. I mean, he, you know, he can make anything out of anything. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess it the that's just it's just unnecessary. It was unnecessary in the comic book, but I got you know I think that's Alan Moore, isn't it? Isn't that yeah. right? Yeah, Alan Moore's point a difference. was There's that a difference he is between... moving away from his humanity, and so as he moves away from humanity, he's no longer ashamed of his body. He doesn't right. care if people right. see him right. in the comic. Also, it's a it's a program. still photo. It's a still photo, and you can see him, and it's drawn. But when it's actually like a guy standing there and moving around, and it moves too, it's like, come on, man, like. <laughs> I'm trying to pay attention to a story here. I can't put that, put it away. I guess, I guess to, to the underlying question to what I want to talk about is this. You know, you've got, you've got a, a, you've got source material and you have the adaptation. 
how do you as a comic book fan and a comic book movie fan, and I want to separate those two things for a second, I have said on this podcast and in my life, and as has Phil, the the adaptation has to stand on its own. It has yes. to, you know, because it just has to. Like, you shouldn't have to know anything going in. Um, how do you feel about that? As it as it relates to comic book movies, as a as a comic book fan, I think you're absolutely right. The adaptation has to stand on its own. But I think a corollary I would add when you have something as deep as the comic book source material is it has to stand on its own. But it will absolutely be compared to the source material. Um, and I mean that like in a way that maybe Doctor, but not Bob by the majority of people, right? See, I don't think that I don't think that's true. I think it will by the majority of people because the people who will compare it will be loud and vocal about it, especially nowadays. But like Doctor Zhivago, you can watch that movie and have, and you know, you might, you're rarely going to run into somebody who's like, "Well, this was different from the book." <laughs> right. You know, right. you may or may not like that movie, and you may or may not like the book, but you're probably not going to be entering into a conversation where you're like, "Well, this was a point in Doctor Zhivago where I thought they strayed from the source material and really should have stuck." truer to its depressing Russian roots. Um, right. But in like comic books, like with the Batman series, people are going to complain about such and such veered away. This was not right. I mean, people about Watchmen and people were complaining before the movie came out. Yeah. Well, Andy, how- and I, Andy and I have been complaining about World War Z. And, and it, I mean, I've been complaining about World War Z for six months now and the movie doesn't come out till this summer. Yeah. So... Well, I think that happens more often now, but I think still uh, the discernible amount of rage you're going to hear. I guess that it's true that that happens with a lot of source materials when the source material is particularly recent, well, it's, popular. Star Trek, the Star Trek movie was similar. It's people, not when it's popular. It's when the people who love it are total freaks. <laughs> if, I can, if, I can, if I can speak to the World War Z thing and, and use it, and use it in, in sort of the larger context. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm a freak about World War Z. And yeah, me it, too. Me it, too. It, 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 true. And it bugs the crap out of me that they're making a movie that does not look like World War Z and calling it World War Z. But the bigger issue to me, honestly, is that it looks terrible. And the reason that, in my heart of hearts, that I know that that's true is that my favorite horror movie of all time, Phil knows this, is the original Dawn of the Dead. Yeah. Okay? The remake is a terrible, terrible, terrible remake of Dawn of the Dead. But it's not a bad movie. I went in expecting to be boo-scared. I was boo-scared. It's rewatchable. And and that's that. Like, I just sort of forget that it's... Which is weird because I never forget what it's called. But I just sort of forget the connection between the two. So I feel like... I feel like if World War Z looked like a good movie that had nothing to do with it, or if, if... even if I disagreed with some changes that happen in comic book movies, like like the end of Watchmen, for example, but the rest of it was satisfying, I feel like I'd be okay with it. Um, but that's... Well, I, think, I think the hard part, though, I think this ties into what I'm saying, where it gets it's going to be compared to the original source material, is if you make those changes, they had better make it better. Because, sure. like Watchmen... If, if again, if it was Doctor Zhivago and they changed the ending, and you know you've never read Doctor Zhivago, you might be like, ah, oh, I didn't, I didn't like the ending, but it was okay. Right. Where, with Watchmen, when you're like, oh, I didn't really like that ending, and they had a good ending. Why did they right. screw it up? The okay. ending they took, they took, and I actually forget to be completely honest the differences in the endings. Tell me if I'm wrong, and I won't do spoilers here. But if I remember correctly, in the in the in the comic book. The, the the actual existence of the world is at stake. Yes. And and uh, in the movie oh. it's not. Oh. No, it is no, it is in both. Uh okay. the big difference okay. I feel like there's there doesn't have to be a spoilers warning. The comic book's been out for like twenty five years. <laughs> it's true. If you haven't read it by now, you don't get a spoiler alert. Okay. Uh, I mean, okay. In the comic in the comic book movie it's a giant squid monster. Right. In the comic book, it's a giant squid monster. In the movie, it's Doctor Manhattan blowing up a city, I believe. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think the difference is that the squid monster, people think it's an alien, and so they're afraid that the aliens are coming, and so the people will draw together is the idea. 
Right. The problem with the movie is it's Doctor Manhattan, so it's a human-made disaster still. Right. An American because he because he's he's like known for he's like Superman like he like Superman isn't a French superhero like he's he's like yes he's from Krypton but he's truth justice the American way right right, right. so by making Doctor Manhattan the the bad guy you've you've changed. You've changed, like, we're going to band together against the United States. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think just in general, with that sort of, with the source material thing, if you're going to, it has to stand on its own, but I think you also have to recognize that it's going to be compared. And if you're changing it, it'd best be for the better. I think that's just, that's sort of where I end up, like, they made changes to, I'm trying to think of a movie that they, I mean, Batman Begins, all of those movies are not exactly like, the um, source material. Sure. But the changes they made fit into the narrative they built. And so it wasn't jarring to me to be like, hold on a second. That's not exactly how it was in the movie or the comic book. That seems strange. I was fine with it because it made sense. Sure. What do you think is the best, not just the best movie, what do you think is the best adaptation? Like what was the thing where you said – all right, like that at the way they adapted that, not even necessarily the best movie, but the way that it was adapted from this from the comic book uh, was the most like the comic book in a way that made sense to you. I'll actually, th- this is great because this will actually tie into the JLA thing we were talking about earlier. Hmm. I think Avengers is very possibly that for me. Oh, wow. Uh, nice. They, they took in the Avengers, what they were able to do in the Avengers movie was bring out the feeling of the Avengers comic book, that these are great and powerful superheroes in their own right who band together to fight huge cataclysmic events. You know, the the issue with the X-Men in comic books and movies has always been Wolverine fights Juggernaut one-on-one and Wolverine can hold his own with Juggernaut. Wolverine, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Nightcrawler, Rogue, however many X-Men fight Juggernaut, they can hold their own against Juggernaut. In theory, they should be whipping him. So... You know, the Avengers don't come together to fight one guy. Right. Um, right. They, you know, they're not called, you know, Iron Man's not calling out Captain America to come help him deal with uh, aging and, and frightening uh, former character actors. Um, <laughs> they're fighting a world ending cataclysmic event. And I really thought that adaptation worked well. And they were able to bring in the humor of the comic books and bring in the sort of serious parts. And to, to make those relationships really work, you know, the Captain America Iron Man relationship is so central to the Avengers. That's part of why it worked. Um, and my fear with the Justice League movie is that to do that, you're going. They're they're clearly not going to be able to. I don't think uh, in their timeline launch a third character. Mm. Uh, so the Avengers had um, Four characters really launched, although the Hulk was so reworked that we might not count him. But they had Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor. And and Hulk, to some degree, doesn't need to be relaunched because Hulk is one of those guys that you know really well. Right. They could throw Spider-Man, they could throw any Spider-Man into the Avengers, and it wouldn't matter because we know who, like, the the, the, the popular culture, pop culture, the, the, the general collective knows who Spider-Man is. Right. And so Hulk right. is one of those guys where... You don't have to know jack about comic books or comic book movies. You know who Hulk is. He's part of our culture in a very like in a Iron much different Man, way. Iron Man, you benefit from from an origin story where it's like he's a billionaire. He used to be a weapons dealer. All this stuff. Hulk, well, and that's why all you that's have to why know it all is really I'm big and green, and I beat things. And it okay, really so- hinged on it really hinged on the success of being able to make Iron Man something because yeah, when they made yeah. what when they made a comic book movie that out of a comic book that wasn't necessarily that popular that people didn't know and it was a huge success they were like oh, wait okay. a minute <laughs> if we can do this then right. anything is possible so about the Justice League here's my question and Andy as a comic book aficionado sort of don't answer let, let Phil take this Can't wait. Phil name the Justice League members. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman? Sure. There's there's more? There's lots more. Oh. Uh, uh, it's, I, I, I mean, now I'm just going to have to spitball DC Comics, people. Is Green well, Lantern here. one of them? Yeah, that's the thing. Is the, and, and that's the thing is, you named the, the trinity of DC. Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman. Mm-hmm. And, then, <laughs> and, then I, and then I threw in Aquaman for good measure. 
I'm guessing because you've seen an episode of Entourage at some point. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I've seen all... Well, no, I, I've actually missed whole seasons of, of Entourage, but I've seen m- many seasons. But I, I remember Aquaman. I remember watching Super Friends when I was a kid. Nice. And there's also... Okay, but you notice they, to, go ahead. Go ahead. You notice in Entourage, they never showed us the Aquaman costume because that costume is not going to work in a movie. Isn't it just orange top and green pants and they have scales? Orange scaled top, green spandex pants, and for most of the series, Aquaman has a hook for a hand. Giant golden hook. I had no terrible, idea. Terrible, wow. Terrible character. Also, he can only do stuff... Oh, wait, isn't Flash one of DC Comics? Yes, there you go. Yep. Okay, okay. So here's the thing. You're somebody who has expressed some interest in, in comic books. Yes, if I put the Justice League in front of you, you'd probably recognize Green Lantern, Flash. Yes. Uh, one you didn't mention is a major uh, character is the Martian Manhunter, um, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. So let's say even if they just went with those six. Okay. Most people are going to know Superman, Batman. Yep. Some folks are going to know Wonder Woman. Most folks will know but have reason right now to disdain Green Lantern okay. uh, as the recent movie. But that leaves you with Flash. Aquaman, Martian Manhunter, and and those are three major characters in the JLA sort of story. Um, And so I think they're going to have real trouble launching that series. Also, I think they have an issue that... But they did that with Avengers where we didn't know Hawkeye and we didn't know Black Widow. We knew Black Widow was an Iron Man too. uh, Kind of. They were introduced in earlier (laughs) movies and it doesn't look like DC is going to have that opportunity. Got it. Well, no, but I mean, I thought that's what I thought DC was saying. They're going to go reverse. They're going to go backwards. Yeah. They're going to start the Justice League and go outwards. But the that. only thing leading into it is it being Man of Steel. And and, my, and I guess my concern is like that. That's a terrible maybe idea. That'll work. Right. But yeah. You know, I I think most people want origin stories for their characters. Like it's okay that we don't have an origin story for Black Widow and Hawkeye because Black Widow and Hawkeye are the two least interesting Avengers at the end of the day. Like, <laughs> right. The people I, I want to see on screen are Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, and the Hulk. I think it's just because I will accept Scarlett Johansson on the screen however you are willing to give her to me. <laughs> well, sure. Here, Phil, here's Scarlett Johansson. Okay, well, do you want to hear her backstory? Whatever, just do I... Do, <laughs> I mean, fine. Her to me. Interestingly, interestingly, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I, think, I think what they're going to run into real problems with... Because of some of the, shall we say, less PC aspects of the character, I think they gotta find a way to put Wonder Woman's origin on screen, like, or do away with it entirely. I mean, she's not PC. I don't know a thing about her story. She is. She loses her power if she allows herself to be tied up, like restrained in any way, by a man. Now that's from like a '60s comic book. They haven't used that in a very long time. But okay, they, she but allows you got to have to deal with it. You, Why you would you have got to deal with that? I guess. Uh, I think the problem is you have to deal with the fact that you know she's an Amazonian princess sent from her secret island in the middle of the Atlantic to come and bring wisdom to the world of men. Flash is a forensic scientist who, in a freak lab experiment, gets super speed. Mm -hmm. The Green Lantern is a member of an intergalactic police force. The Martian Manhunter is the last of a race of peaceful Martians who has all the strength of super, all the strengths of Superman. He literally has almost all of Superman's powers, and he is not not involved. He's not vulnerable to uh, to kryptonite, but he is terrified of fire. Uh, And Aquaman can control. Tell him to get it together. And Aquaman can control dolphins, I think. He's got like a <laughs> talk, to, talk to the animals of the sea. So what you're saying is the DC League, is the DC comics are just inherently lamer? Is that what you're saying? No, I really like, I like the Justice League a lot. I just think they're inherently, they're, I think their characters are generally bigger than that, than that one group. Like the, the Avengers has a few characters, Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America, who have always been popular and had main comics outside of the Avengers. And Hulk. Four. Well, well, Hulk, but he isn't really an Avenger in the comic book most of the time, but in the movie he was. But yeah, he has his own movie. In, but then they have like several members in the comic books and in that movie who have never been big enough to have their own thing and so have always been shoehorned into this larger team story. They're designed to be part of a team. Right. Justice League is a group of 
folks, all of whom have their own mainline comic book. Uh, the Martian Manhunter may not right now, but for the most part, they've almost all always had mainline stories. At least five of them do. And they come together just to face huge big deals that's see that's really interesting because i think that's another thing that sort of that sort of goes back to sort of the 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 philosophies of the two companies right i mean marvel has long been like we're gonna make our superheroes mostly real people you know and just like we're gonna give them like like peter parker has dating issues right like iron man is an alcoholic like these are and and you know He's Superman. a drunk. Okay, he's a drunk. I don't know. If I, right. Let's not. Right. Well, Hank, Hank Pym used to hit his wife. Say again. Hank Pym in uh, the Avengers right. used to hit his wife. Like That's they right. had that in a comic book. Who's Hank Pym? Ant Man. Ant Man. He's gonna be. He's twenty six. Yeah, yeah. Edgar Edgar Wright is doing Ant Man. Very yeah. excited about that. He's excited about it. I don't. I don't care one way or the other. But Edgar <laughs> Wright is very excited. Um. So maybe that's my favorite non-superhero comic book movie would be Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Nice. Because it is a comic book. I've never read the comic book. I That's the other one that I got into besides uh, Walking Dead. Those there are my go. two. Those yeah, are my Scott two. Pilgrim vs. the World is good, both yeah. the comic book and the movie. And and I'll, I'll go further. I think I, I totally agree with you. I would say that, I would say that uh, the changes didn't necessarily make it better, but they certainly didn't make it worse, and it just gave you like a, another option. You know, like... Like, you can experience the story this way, or you can experience the story this way. Yeah, and, and uh, part of what I like when they do make changes is when they buy more fully into a concept that the, the author had expressed but hadn't gone far that far with. Like, the concept of Scott Pilgrim's Life as a video game is part of the comic book. Right. But it's way, it comes across way more intensely in the movie. That's true. Yeah. Um, and the movie and really like, plays. Cool the, the, music, the movie really plays with the visuals and really plays with music. Like, like it, it, it really plays with our, with our. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it really plays with the music aspect. Obviously, they're in a rock band in the comic book, but you can't hear that. You don't really know what they sound like, and so it really plays with that in a really cool way. I think. Right. Uh, yeah. What are you looking forward to more than anything? Is there something coming up that you're just like really psyched about? I mean, I'm really psyched about Iron Man three. Uh, Say Don more. Cheadle, Don Cheadle in the Iron Patriot uh, armor, which is what they called in the comic books, is what they called the uh, red, white, and blue painted Iron Man armor. Um, okay. Looks awesome. And the, in the comic books, the motivation to make that armor was that Iron Man, neither Iron Man nor Captain America, would work for the government. Uh, and so, right. Interesting. The guy in charge at the time was uh, Norman Osborn, who's the Green Goblin. That was complicated, so let's not worry about that. But he created for himself the Iron Patriot armor because he said the because he was forming a new Avengers, and he said the Avengers always have to have Iron Man and Captain America. Interesting. And so he's buying them. Um, so I'm hoping that Don Cheadle and Iron Man get to duke it out. Uh, I also hope they refer to him as Iron Patriot as much as possible. Are, 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 wait, so, but are, they're buddies. They're best friends. Yeah, but I mean, like in the last movie, they were best friends, but they they, they had, had that like, knockdown. Right. There's, there's, there's some like undertones there of where they fight with each other, and uh, um, yeah, okay, um, okay, and, so, and also we've like, are you are you nervous at all because this is the first one John Favreau is not doing, or do you just think that they've got it down now at this point, and Downey Jr.'s got it figured out? I think that's the thing, like legitimately in the second movie, Robert Downey Jr., that scene in Congress could have gone on for two and a half hours and I would have walked out feeling like I had gotten everything I paid for. <laughs> like, I, I think he could, like, he could just walk around, like, in a boardroom talking about things as Iron Man, as Tony Stark, and I would be like, this movie was worth it. I have loved, Absolutely. I have loved Robert, I have loved Robert Downey Jr. since high school. I have loved him, I remember when, in college, when I was in college when he was going through a lot of his drug stuff, and I was rooting for him. Like I, it's funny. Like this sort of like comeback or whatever he is now. He's one of the greatest stars in whatever. And, and for a lot of people, like oh, that Robert Downey Jr. And I've been. I remember um, I wrote a screenplay in college, and I wrote one of the parts with him in my in my mind because I was like, he to me has been one of my favorite actors. I just think he's a great actor. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 so for me, it's a joy that he is as big as he is right now. Um, 
because he's actually really good. Like, he's just really... He's one of those guys who's like, you know he could sit around... I mean, he's so talented. He could play the piano. He could do it. I mean, he could do anything. He could just do anything. He's one of those guys... If he started juggling fire, would you be shocked? No. <laughs> no. Like, if Robert Downey Jr. was just like, oh, I juggle fire, you'd be like, of course you do. Of course you do, Junior Downey. That's just how you roll. <laughs> just not yeah, a surprise. And he has successfully landed himself, you know, not just one huge pair of franchises. I mean, if you think of the Avengers and Iron Man as two separate franchises. And then sort of, Sherlock Holmes on top of that. Right, and then Sherlock Holmes as a third sort of like, oh, this is and a side manages, project. And I manages sometimes star not, Sherlock Holmes. And manages not to feel like a sellout like Johnny Depp does. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like now, maybe Johnny Depp can't. feels deeply like a sellout to me. Yeah. And, and, and Junior Downey just doesn't. He just is like... I'm having a great time. Like all of those are creatively interesting movies. Sherlock Holmes, I think, and I'm not a huge Guy Ritchie fan, but I think that I think the two Sherlock Holmes movies have been very creatively like interesting. They're well, not just that's, cookie cutter. That's my one concern with the third Iron Man movie is that I think that nobody thought that about Johnny Depp. Well, not nobody, but most people didn't think that about Johnny Depp until the third Pirates movie, when it was very clear that they had run out of story to tell. Yeah, and just we're just asking you for money, basically. At yep. the movie, they're like. We're not actually telling you anything interesting, but we'd like your ten dollars. The thing that I'm excited about is, and Andy and I just talked about it on Project Melway last week. Project Melway plug is that um, is is that the guy who wrote and directed Iron Man three is Shane Black, who created the original Lethal Weapon. And uh, huh. he's yeah. not he's not he's not one hundred percent. He hasn't every single thing he touches turns to gold, but he's capable of really really good right and. And something recent, like like to more recent than Lethal Weapon and not Iron Man, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is just which I've never seen, but people really really love. Oh, that. you've got to see that, really oh, Phil. You've got to see. Have you seen that? Yeah, it's wonderful. It's great. It's great, and it's got it's it, basically. Does that have Val Kilmer in it? Yes. See, I I I. Love Val Kilmer, although that has become more and more dubious in the past decade. Not once you see Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, your, your level will, will return full force. And what I love about it is that he gets, like, there are just some people, it, it's like, we've talked about David Mamet and how some people just can't say his dialogue. Right. Robert Downey Jr. and Shane Black. Oh, good. Well, that's great. Hand in glove. That's great. What are the chances that Don Cheadle says, I'm too old for this stuff? <laughs> Um, genius, genius. The I'll tell you two two not things that give as me high as I want them to be. Two <laughs> things that give me confidence, and two things that give me confidence in Iron Man three. One is kind of what you said, Chris, which is that at this point, I think Junior Downey has so much love for the character and so much understanding of the character that there's this sense that he's he's not going to let this. I could be wrong, but I feel like. Even throughout, going back to Johnny Depp, even throughout Pirates of the Caribbean, it was like Johnny Depp had figured out this this weird, goofy thing to do, but he was never like, and they were like, oh yeah, people like it, so we'll just keep making it. But Robert Downey Jr. seems to have this love of the Iron Man character and Tony yeah. Stark, and I almost feel like he cares about it enough that he's going to do his, he's going to invest in that. And the, but the other thing is, frankly, both the trailers for it and the the big trailer they showed at Super Bowl Sunday, which just said. Uh, what was it called? An intense look or a closer <laughs> look? <laughs> An extended look. And it was just Tony Stark staring for a really long time at the camera. Like, and then when, but then when they actually showed little bitty footage of it, I was like, all right, they're clearly going for it here. Like they, I think they really know what they've got. And they really, every, see, every, every Iron Man, they do try to ratchet it up a notch and really try to give you something special. So I hope, yeah. I hope that they continue to do that. Um, I, I have, I, I'm really interested, by the way, in uh, there's sort of an unsung hero to this whole f this whole thing, right? Um, I think Joss Whedon did a phenomenal job with the writers and writing and directing of Avengers, but we all know that, and everybody knows his name, and everyone's talking about him. John Favreau needs to get some credit because he made an amazing. I mean, he made two amazing movies: Iron Man and Iron Man Two. And he's been, by the way, secretly executive producing everything since then. Right. So right. he's, you know, first of all, right now, he's literally rolling in gold. Yeah, yeah. He's got, <laughs> the finger thing means the money. He's literally like, just like, 
la la la. I gotta. I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna disagree with you. I, not not that I don't think he deserves the credit. I absolutely think he does. I think he's gotten it. I think. I don't remember. I don't remember the lag time between announcing that Favreau would not direct Avengers because he was supposed to direct Avengers, and then and then the announcement of Joss Whedon. But when he, when it was when it was announced that he wasn't going to direct the Avengers, people were like, oh. And yeah. then and then yeah. when it was when it was announced that Joss Whedon, I mean, I was like, yay! And everyone who isn't a Buffy fan was like, meh. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And and so I, I just I he could always he, indeed. Figure. Well, your, your, com- your comment earlier about him killing off a character, I read somewhere uh, before the first before Captain America came out because he rewrote that script. Uh, somebody yeah. was saying, you know, this is a Joss Whedon movie, so Captain America is going to die in the first five minutes. And it's going to be an hour. <laughs> That's right. Like, That's right. People dealing with the fallout. He is. He has said that his plan or his his wish for Avengers two is to make it much smaller. And much more painful. And I was like, "Ooh, I hate you and love you, Jazz Whedon." Ah. So when he killed Wash, I thought I was gonna have to. I, I, have, not, I have not experienced. Him. When he killed what? Killed Wash and Firefly. Oh, that doesn't mean anything to me. But okay. You haven't seen Firefly? We Phil, no. Phil has very strange, uh, as do I. There, there are very strange holes in his pop culture. I don't think so. I've seen bits of Joss Whedon and not really gotten into him. I don't think it's a hole. It's not something I'm interested in. Um, I'm not talking there... about Joss Whedon. I don't like Buffy really that much. I don't like Angel that much. Firefly is space western. Okay, well, I saw space Serenity, I saw the, I saw Serenity the movie. I saw Serenity the movie and I really enjoyed it. There you go. Yeah. So, I'll check, so I'll check out Firefly. I'm willing to check out Firefly. Sure. sure. I'm probably, probably, because I've seen enough... I'll probably never watch Buffy or Angel. I might someday, just just because there are enough of my friends that are like freaky. But honestly, most of them, I don't really trust their taste. So um, most, not all, most. No, no, I, 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 I usually trust your taste. I usually trust your taste. Sure. But I, but I, I, uh, uh, but Firefly, I will check out. Also because it's a lower investment. Indeed. That's my big thing with Buffy and Angel is that if you're investing, it's like 13 seasons of television. Right. That is right. And I'm not a lot. Yeah. Right. I, I, I don't need to watch Angel. I used to watch Bones. I'm all set. Nice. I can see that guy. I'm nice. all set. Do, David Bar- <laughs> uh, Andy, Andy, I was Andy, wondering what you were going to try and say his name. Andy, David Bar- <laughs> no, 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 Not going to watch that TV show. <laughs> hey, Andy, uh, what, what are you looking forward to? What comic book are you looking forward to? Comic book movie. Comic movie. Uh, I am looking forward to... Um, let's, I mean, Iron Man 3 is obvious, right? I've just, sure. I'm so looking forward to it. The next, the, 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 I'm looking forward to Captain America 2. I, I really, I'm excited for the storyline that, and, I, and again, these are all things I know just the basic plots for, because I don't know them real well. I'm excited for that, for what they're going to be doing, and I'm excited for Ant-Man. I really am. Edgar Wright. Just on princi- Do you know anything about the Ant-Man comic book, or is it just on the principle of the director and right. how much he loves it? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get extraordinarily geeky here for a second. This is, is by far the geekiest podcast, by far. By far. By far the geekiest podcast we have ever done. Way to go, Chris. And by Thank the way, so much. And, and by the way, it looks like it's going to stretch into a two-parter, which means it's by far the two geekiest podcasts Indeed. we've ever done. Indeed, um, there is a cartoon called Avengers: Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Chris, have you seen it? Uh, it's a movie, a cartoon movie, right? No, it's no, it's just a cart- thirty-minute episodes. Oh, they're, I haven't seen that. They they're streaming on Netflix, and honestly, I couldn't recommend them more highly. I mean, it's a cartoon, and it's kind of for, i mean it's it's not like adult cartoon but it's not it, they deal with situations that are as adult as the comic books that they are based on and and it it starts like it starts and it slowly introduces the avengers it really is like reading a really long comic book and i know ant-man from that uh it has ant-man it has wasp uh, uh, Hank Pym, the character, the, the, that's the Ant-Man, that's Ant-Man's alter ego, um, or all, Ant-Man is Hank Pym's alter ego. Uh, uh, he abdicates for a while. He's like, nope, I'm done. I'm not going to be a superhero for a while for, or forever. 
I just, I can't, because he's like a man of peace, but, but also in the comic book, apparently he beats his wife. Like it's a, it's, it's just a fascinating, it's a fascinating character. And, and you, uh, you heard it here, folks. Andy Roth is a, a fan of, of domestic abuse. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I heard. I, I don't know what you heard, but that's what I heard. Ladies, he's single. Um, you are single. It's true. <laughs> So, so yeah, I, I, and, and Edgar Wright, Edgar Wright, I, he literally, I mean, the next time he's wrong will be the first time, uh, in terms Wait, of... Wait, did he, did he direct Paul? Nope. Oh, well then, okay. Because that was not a good movie. Good talk. Okay, well, I was just checking. <laughs> no, because it's, wait a minute, don't be like that about it. It's got all the guys from the other movies he directed. That's fine. So I wasn't sure if he did Paul, I was checking. Yeah, it's fine. I'm just did saying. Paul come out? You're just being a jerk. What's that? Did Paul come out? That's one of those movies Paul, I feel like was out for Paul like a day and a half. Paul came out for like a second and a half. It did come out, and and, and I saw Bill... it, Chris, and I got to tell you, um, it's it's, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, it, viewers and listeners, audience, Chris and I are both priests. Um, now, now we're both fine with the secular world, and we don't need things to be religious and blah 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 blah. Paul is aggressively atheist. Paul is like mo- openly mocks. Um, not just, I mean, they sit, they mock fundamentalists, but they really mock basically the whole. The, this this aliens basically like the only reason you believe in God is because you haven't seen as much of the, the the universe as I have. That's actually like the main character, and I personally couldn't get past it, even though it's not a bad movie. It's not a great movie, and I, it's not a bad movie. But literally, it was for me very hard because it was like the whole thing is like, ha, 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 you believe in God? You're an idiot. Okay, see. The reason what? I'm being a jerk, <laughs> Phil. The reason I'm being a jerk is you're 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 coming after my man crush, Edgar Wright. All right, but he's you're not right? in that movie. You just said he didn't direct. It. I know, and that's well, why I'm that's <laughs> why I'm getting all snippy. Okay, but relax. Like Edgar Wright made Ten my favorite. Ten seconds of googling, bud. Ten seconds of googling. You could do it while skyping. I'm no. I if I'm gonna not look at the Skype while we talk, it's gonna be because I'm on Facebook, not because if I'm on Google. Just for the you, record, it, you you okay. make a good point. I can't. Okay. I, so here, so here's the deal. Edgar Wright. Yeah, he made he made Shaun of the Dead. He made Hot Fuzz, which uh, Chris I saw with you for the. I saw Shaun of the Dead for the first time with Andy, and I saw Hot Fuzz for the first time with Chris. Did you really? I didn't realize yes. that. I didn't yes. realize that. Yes. I'm honored. Fantastic. And, and, and then, uh, and then, so I'm excited, and they've got a new one coming out this summer, which I'm very excited about. And he made Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, which was my favorite movie of a couple years ago. So I'm in, Edgar Wright. Whatever you want to do to me, I'm in. Mentioning uh, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, uh, a comic book that I really like them to make into a movie. Please. There's a series called, called The Boys. Uh, in it, uh, superheroes are um, all controlled by a corporation. Um, and basically, they don't really do anything good. They just are m- merchandising things, and the corporation is part of the very evil in this world um, military industrial complex. Awesome. Um, but they were really bad at it, so then they invented superheroes. Like they were bad at making weapons and things, so then they invented a formula to make superheroes. So the reason why you mentioning uh, those two movies, Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead, made me think of it is the main character is modeled after Simon Pegg. Oh wow! Is oh, my God. Well, Pegg. I know what I'm doing tomorrow. I wonder. I wonder how the author of this comic book feels about Republicans. <laughs> just wondering. I'm just listen. I'm just wondering. I don't have an opinion myself. But so um, the, the boys is a group of uh, yeah, individuals sponsored by the CIA who are given the formula and their job is to keep the superheroes in line. And so like they go out and like beat up bad superheroes. Um, (laughs) And so I think it would be, I think that's sort of the, I'm interested to see if that's the next place because it is sort of aggressively anti the common view of superheroes. And so when eventually we're going to get around to that, because that's a big thing in comic right now. There's a lot of comic books doing that, sort of turning the traditional superhero ideas on their heads. Mm-hmm. When something like that is going to get made into a movie and actually but be that's done very right. similar, very. I mean, it's very different in one way, but it's similar in a lot of what you're saying to me uh, to the Watchmen in the sense of like turning this idea of our, is it really good to have these guys on our side or have these superheroes? Is it actually good for us? It sounds very yeah, similar. It, it's like the Watchmen, but uh, and this sounds weird, but like more aggressively 
I, more contemporarily re- realistic. Like, oh, okay. if the Watchmen, because the people who are superheroes do actually have superpowers, and so they just run rampant abusing them. In a, oh, wow. So the, the way Simon Pegg gets pulled into the whole group is he has just proposed to his fiance and is dancing around at a, some sort of fair in Scotland, and the superhero on the big team that's sort of like the Justice League called The Seven, uh, his name is A-Train, uh, and is super fast. He's the flash of the team. Um, is fighting some other fast guy, and they run across the ocean and run through this fair. And Simon Pegg, at one point, is spinning his girlfriend, and the next moment, just has her arms because the super speed hero and villain have just run through her. Wow! And so that's how he gets. That's how he gets pulled into the world. Is that these super and nothing happens to the superhero. Like that's just the way of the world. It's collateral damage when these super beings fight. That's just the way people, it is. People die. That's the way it goes. Yeah, and so it's uh, it's very that, that, that's interesting to me. That's it. That's very interesting to me. And um, super snarky uh, British, awesome. I love it. I can't snarky wait. British. You could have just said British. I would have inferred the rest. <laughs> um, well, do you snarky British or you know Dean Markham British? Andy doesn't know who the most of the world doesn't know who Dean Markham is, dude. Well, I'm All just right. saying for you. Okay. Uh, when that's the guy who was the dean of our seminary. He's British and he's like not snarky. He's like the most sincere guy ever. <laughs> just, just the most sincere Brit you could possibly meet. No. He became so sincere that they made him an American citizen. That's how sincere he became. <laughs> wow. Because they were like, nothing's you can't so be, like being American. You can't American. be British anymore. You can't be British anymore. And when he got his citizenship, I walked up to him and shook his hand and said, listen, we're not a perfect country, but we're the best country. It's... Nice. That's not the same thing. I acknowledge all sorts of faults with America. America is a total disaster. It's just less than other places. Um, I didn't. I, I think uh, the thing I'm looking for. Tell you both. I trust you guys because you're more comic book geeky than me. But sure. is it the thing I'm most excited about? Is so. It's so. I really want Man of Steel to be good. I really want there to be a Superman. Yeah. And the one preview they showed made me like. I got real. I started getting teary eyed during the preview. Yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping that it. I hope it. Le- I hope it lives up to that. You know, here's here's what I don't like about Man of Steel. What I've seen so far, and it's the only thing I don't like. Just because Christopher Nolan was successful, doesn't mean that every successful comic book movie has to be exactly like that. But we right? know that it doesn't because we've already seen the Avengers and all the Marvel stuff. Well, I so- understand that. I understand that. But that's Marvel, and this is DC. And but I'm maybe worried. DC wants to create a universe that's consistent with what Nolan's vision is. That's what Andy was or Chris was saying. The possibility of that. I would, I would, I would say that you're right, and I would, and I want you to be right. But the the way they're handling it doesn't make me think they have that much of a plan. But anyway, Chris, I, be, I think you might be right, and I really hope you're not because I think Superman fitting into a gritty Christopher Nolan Batman like world is a terrible idea yep. because Superman at the end of the day, isn't gritty. Superman is the boy scout. It's how people refer to him as a di- as an insult, as a compliment. He's always going to do the right thing because he's not gritty. He's a good, wholesome American guy, which is exactly what you need because otherwise he's the ruler of the world because he's Superman. Right. right. If he's not like, if he's not an eternal good guy, if he's gritty and dark and might, you know, beat somebody up by being angry, why doesn't he just take over? Right. Um, having said that, this is not the least gritty part of that preview, and I get goosebumps just thinking about it, and all the implications for the movie, where where young Clark asks his dad, Kevin Costner, so I should have just let that kid die, and Kevin Costner's like, I don't know, maybe. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Right, maybe. Oh. She's like, Kevin Costner as Jonathan Kent is some really great casting. Yeah, agreed. Kevin Costner, just just Andy, Roth, Andy Roth, full disclosure, Chris Robinson watches The Postman once a year. Awesome. So it's you're so the one. good. It is so no, it's, good. If I shook it's my the, head any harder, if I shook my head any harder, I'd pass out. Listen, did you not see the obvious nod that they gave to that movie in Return of the King? Return of the King had six endings. So did The Postman. Um... Have have, have I have I lost have I lost the Skype feed or are you so wrong that I've gone blind? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not I, I can't. Mother. Yep. Ma- yep. Mother. Yep. Yeah. You're done. Uh, 
Kevin Costner is another another one of those actors like Will Smith that we were talking about earlier. Uh, uh, that I I legitimately like almost every movie Kevin Costner's ever been in because I like Kevin Costner that much. Like I will watch him. Like I've, I've watched terrible movies with him and just been like, I like you, Kevin Costner. You seem like a cool dude. We should hang out. Nice, nice. Yeah. Kevin Costner is legitimately trying to clean up all the world's water. Is he really? Yeah, look it up. Look it up. Kevin Costner has put money into water purification, like on a mass scale. They're trying to do this thing that would actually, like, for instance, like when there's an oil spill, they would go and put this machine that he and his brother are pouring money into. Yes, that I've, I've, I've read about all this. Water. Nice. It's, I mean, he he is a legitimately good. Like he try. He actually thinks in terms of like, I wonder if I could use my powers for good. Well, I mean, you know where that started. I mean, I mean, I mean, the the, the in Waterworld, he had that thing where it he like. He could drink Gilt. his own pee. So, yeah. you know, you know, there's yeah. that. But it's also a movie that I like. That's terrible. <laughs> Waterworld's like great because it's just a remake of uh, the Mad Max, of Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior. And it's got Dennis Hopper, Hopper in it. It's got Dennis Hopper in it. And yeah. I love Dennis Hopper. And, yes. uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, mean, I like Kevin Costner. I would do, I would consider uh, the, the giving Kevin Costner the Project Melway treatment someday down the line, maybe. Indeed. Indeed. I sense but, we're getting slightly off the reservation. Yeah, I think we're yeah. good. Do we have any? Do we have anything else we need to say about comic books for now? No, I mean, Andy, but, Chris, Chris, we're clearly going to have you back on down the line. Maybe, maybe when Man of Steel comes out, we'll like the three of us can get back together and talk about that. Right. Um, I, yeah, I would say I would say for Iron the, Man, I, I would say we'd have you back for Iron Man three, but I would be afraid that that would be just an hour and a half of all three of us going ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I apologize, Chris. I interrupted you. One of us would say something about Iron Man 3 and the other two would open up the pirated bootleg they've already got. Like, just be like, I want to watch it again. <laughs> Bye, guys. I got to go watch the movie. Yeah. <laughs> no, totally. That would be you, too, because I respect property rights. Yeah, it would be you because I do as well. Okay. So, it's all you, Chris. So, uh, FBI, you're looking <laughs> for Chris. I know, Chris, by the way, did not. he was like, I'm not even going to. It's fine. Whatever. I'll do that <laughs> later. I respect property rights. No, you don't. <laughs> Not when it comes to getting movies early. You're a dirty commie and a liar. Come on, wow. we know that. All Listen, right. I, I own all the movies. I know in the you world. do. Nice. I know you do. Nice. I know. Um, no, but you are the kind of guy that you would own a bootleg copy, and then when it came out on DVD, you would buy it. Like, that oh, is how you roll. Generally. I want the special features. I mean, the special features oh. on DVD, especially now, like, this, the amount of stuff they're putting on DVDs, you almost have to buy them because... No, well, you do. See, Andy, this is the difference between Chris and I. I will buy all this stuff and just watch the movie. Chris will spend hours watching. And he'll be like, I watched three different versions of the commentary of this show last night. I've never done that. And, I, and <laughs> I'm actually not making fun of you for it. I'm glad you do that because no, totally. what will happen is Chris will then tell me, oh, this is what happened. And he'll tell me the story. And he then watches like, the commentary so you don't have to. We yes. watched the, uh, in college. I watched with a couple of dudes the entire extended edition Lord of the Rings after I got it. And it was like, man, this is really good. And it's like 12 hours of yeah. Lord of the Rings, yep. which is incredible. And then we proceeded to be like, well, we're not really done Lord of the Rings geeking out. Do y'all want to watch the special editions, like the, the special stuff? And it turns out that makes that, that watching go up to about 40 hours. Yeah. Because there is a lot of it. Yeah. It's I think, I think and, Andy, if we had been – because Chris is just – Chris is five years younger than us. Mm -hmm. If we if we had been in college when he was in college, after the advent of Blu-ray and like DVDs were just coming out at the end of our college time, if we were in college in his time, like I think we would still be in college. <laughs> there would have been there would have been a three month period immediately following the release of the extended editions, or I I wouldn't have showered. It's just no, like it's no. like I would not have changed clothes. Forest creatures would be living on me. Just yeah. Everyone, no, every once in a while, we would have a friend come in and just hose us down and then leave. <laughs> it's like, indeed, indeed. More pizza. Well, yeah. uh, well clearly, uh, clearly, Chris, you are a you are a kindred spirit, and I cannot wait to have you on again to talk more about comic book movies and superhero movies in the future. But uh, in the interest of letting our letting our audience uh, get on with their lives, although I don't know why they would, we have so many podcasts for them to watch. Right. Uh, uh, shall we say, shall we bid them adieu? Yeah, let's bid them adieu. Adieu. Uh, so, everybody, this has been another Second Breakfast Podcast. I'm Andy Roth, alongside Phil Duvall and our special guest, Chris Robinson. Thanks very much for tuning in. We'll see you again real soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.